Lions Rock Productions. This is Jay this Moore. This is Greg Proops. This is Jordan Harbin. This is Dexter from The Offspring. This is Nathan this is East. Sebastian Younger. This is Rick Morales. This is Stuart Copeland. This is Mick Gillette. This is Andy Summers. Hey, this is Scott Baxter. This is Gabby Reese. This is Rob Bell. Hey, this is John Leon Guerrero. Hey, and this is Pete A. Turner. This is Kevin McNamara, and you're watching The Break It Down Show. And now, The Break It Down Show with John Leon Guerrero and Pete A. Turner. Yeah, man, this is cool. We're back here in your, uh, in your backyard garden. It's so fancy with your lemon tree and everything. My humble bed, I've got my lime tree here, I've got my orange tree there, and my uh, avocado tree over there behind us. So I'm, I'm ready to rock when, the, uh, when, when Armageddon comes down. <laughs> yeah, I, I guess we should mention the fact that you're, uh, we're going to be live with Jay Moore this week at uh, Bastard's Canteen, the new restaurant in Temecula. It's already, I think, sold out. I think, uh, yeah, I think they have, uh, when, I, when I spoke to them last, they said they had, I think, 26 tickets left. But uh, of those 26 tickets, I needed five. <laughs> so we're down to 21 for those of you watching. And uh, by, by by game time, I'm pretty sure we're going to be completely sold out. I know they sold out of the VIP booth tickets. So open for someone like Jay Moore. I mean, Jay's been around forever and ever. But you also established yourself. I mean, you can go out and headline your own shows. What is that like to open for somebody, even if it is someone of Jay's caliber? I mean, I've been opening for, for bigger comedians for a long time. Um, I, I, I'm actually not, I'm not a headliner. Um, I haven't kind of reached that plateau yet, uh, just because I haven't been in the game long enough as far as stand-up goes to do so. I've really only been doing stand-up for three years, um, but I've, I've kind of progressed fairly quickly. Um, but I've opened, you know, I opened for, for Brian Callen, I've opened for Eric Griffin, I've opened for, um, you know, Bill Burr, all these, all these big guys, you know, at shows here around LA and, you yeah. know, I, I travel with Brian, I tour with Brian quite a bit, Brian Callen. So yeah, it's, uh, it's one of those things where it's, it's fun. It's always fun to work with somebody new and, you know, I've worked with Jay before we've, we've done some shows at the Roosevelt hotel, hotel together and, uh, Jay's great, man. I'm excited. It's going to be, it's going to be interesting because, Jay's such a clean comic, and I'm exactly the opposite of that. So, and when you say clean comic, there's also two boys sucking each other's penises in his ass. <laughs> that sounds pretty clean. You know, yeah, getting, yeah. getting two penises clean at the same time. There's, there's nothing dirty about that. If you didn't live in LA and Hollywood, you'd be a headlining act. I mean, look, you have to pick guys who are enormous dudes to not be doing your own headline. Yeah, I mean, Listen, it, it typically it takes, they say, minimal 10 years to be a headliner, to, to have a strong enough act and, and uh, to have an ex- enough experience on stage to, to be a true headliner. Um, my goal is to be there within the next year or two, so, you know, four to five years in. Um, but I'd like to shoot my, my first 30-minute special by next year. And right now I would say I probably have a strong enough 30 minutes to shoot a 30-minute special right now, but... I want to work towards that, you know, super strong 30 minute, 30 minute set. Cause so many people are expecting me to fail. What's the heart of what you do comedy wise then? I mean, we know what Dave Chappelle does. He's pretty much the maestro of everybody right now. I mean, Kevin Hart can play stadiums. So what's Kevin McNamara? Uh, God, I would have to say pushing back against the uh, woke mob is, is kind of where I'm at right now. Um, I think that there is an attack on, on the First Amendment and specifically on uh, conservative voices. And um, especially in the arena of, of stand-up comedy right now, kind of everything you, you, you say is brought under a microscope. And if it doesn't fit the narrative of the media or uh, the woke mob, you kind of start getting doxxed. And um, I'm pushing back against that. All those people who say that you can't talk about this or you can't talk about that, those are the first topics that I jump on when I get on stage. Is that dangerous for your career? Because you're not just a comedian. <laughs> like, you also do other stuff. you got to go sit across from people who are, who are woke. I mean, like, they're like, no, it's time to understand these things. We have to see these other parts of the problem. I think the situation in Hollywood is fluid. I think currently the climate is very much left-wing and, and pushing everything towards... Um, race, the, 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 the racial inequality and, and woke idealism. Um, but like anything else, I think that it, it's, I think it swings back. I think it's, you know, it's, it's a pendulum. I think it swings back. I think right now it's swinging 
hard left, but I think it's going to swing back to, you know, the, the moderate side of things or, or hopefully a little bit more conservative. Um, just depending on, on who you work with the show that I'm on, uh, currently, or that I've been on currently, uh, is a CBS produced show and CBS is pretty focused on making sure that they're in, in line with the, uh, the current climate. Um, but I don't foresee it being an issue because I don't, I don't go overtly, uh, I don't go overtly right wing. Right. Um, I do have, you know, talking points that would be considered conservative and I do have a conservative view. Um, but I don't, I, I do it with wit. Mm. I, I don't just throw, uh, I, I don't just like to throw jokes out there that are just shock and awe. I like to throw jokes out there that kind of keep you guessing yeah. and, 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 and take you on twists and turns and not just throw something out there that, that's going to hurt people or upset yeah. people. I want to make everybody laugh, whether you're left wing, right wing, conservative, or yeah. lib- libertarian, whatever it is. Um, yeah, it's important. I think it's important when you're, when you're working with those types of topics that they're really well thought out jokes. And that's what I try to do. We, uh, I mean, these things are challenging, right? So right now could be, that I've been driving for a little over an hour that the Kyle Rittenhouse uh, verdict might even be in right now. I don't know. But yeah. As a combat guy, here's how I see this. And, and I don't know enough about the trial. I'm not sitting in the jury box, so I don't have enough specific knowledge. But if you put yourself into a situation where the proper authorities can no longer control law and order and peace, and I'm not talking about a protest. I'm talking about when you get past that. Um, the gods of war don't oblige anybody's anything. You can be the best warrior in the world. I mean, Patton broke his neck in a car accident at the end of World War II. Right. I mean, it's anything can happen when you're in a place where there's chaos. So if you put yourself into that environment, there, there is no guarantee of well-being. There is no guarantee of self-defense or not self because it's just it's chaos. Chaos is ruling. Anarchy is ruling. And so I don't see that there's any good outcome. I mean, there's misconduct, it seems like, from the prosecution. There's legitimate concerns about why a 17-year-old has a rifle out in a, another state. I mean, you know, Kenosha and, and where he lives. I mean, I've lived up in that area. It's not far at all. Right. Like, that's that's a suburb. It's a couple hours. Yeah. Not even that. I mean, it's yeah. so, so, so close. And then uh, legitimately, he can say, I feared for my safety because the entire area was dangerous. How did you sort that out? How do you figure out? There's no, there is no right answer. How do you figure out? I mean, let's call it what it is. Let's, let's, let's break it down to the, the most simplified version of it. To call it a protest is a joke. It wasn't a protest at that point. It was a riot. Um, you've got people looting. You've got people burning down businesses. You've got people being attacked and, and violently attacked with uh, weapons and being jumped by multiple people. Um, I think the the Kyle Rittenhouse situation is interesting in the fact that I truly believe that he was there to do good. I think he was there to um, to protect businesses and also. Um, to, to administer aid and, and be there to, to help people out that might need it, put out fires and things like that. Um, I think the situation that came from him being there, um, I think they're just bad people that were looking to do bad and they put themselves in front of somebody who was willing to fight for what they believe in. And I think regardless of age 17 or 30, right. the, calm and cool demeanor that he carried himself with and the way that he handled his weapon and uh, the way that he went out of his way to try and stem the situation by running and they pursued him and they put him in a a situation where he had to defend his life. I think if he would have just gone there with, without a weapon and tried to administer aid, I think the same situation would have happened. You know, you have, like I said, let's call it what it is. You have predators. The you know the the Rosen House guy was a sexual predator. The other guy was a was also a, a, a violent felon. Right. Um, both of which had weapons. Rosen Rosenberg or Rosenblum had a chain, and the other guy had a handgun. Yeah. Um, the other guy had a skateboard. The third guy. Um, I think if he, I think the situation is the same. I think if he's running around trying to put out fires, which is what started the whole situation. They were, they were starting to start a fire and he was trying to put the fire out and that's why it escalated. I think you put him in that situation without a weapon and that kid's dead and or kidnapped or gone. Or And, and do I feel bad about three felons, one of which being a, a child pedophile rapist, anally raped a nine-year-old? Um, do I feel bad about him, him being gone? No. 
Yeah. Would I feel bad about Kyle Rittenhouse being gone? Somebody who was trying to help? Yes. We also don't spend much time talking about the other victims who've lost their complete livelihood, lost their lives, have been maimed uh, through these. And I, when I'm saying riots, we're talking, there's a clear line between the riot and the protest. I think we all support the right to protest. You can vigorously protest, but burning someone's business, murdering a man, murdering people in general. Um, yeah, I mean, we're not talking about those people who've lost everything. And we are talking about Kyle and a child rapist. It is a, it's a little galling. Yeah. It's a, it's a, it's a, and, and, and a situation that really upsets me about this is they're constantly talking about, well, why was he there? Why did he need to be there? Well, where were you? Where those who are judging him, where were you? Why weren't you there putting out fires? Why weren't you there administering aid? Why weren't you there trying to protect your neighborhood? And he wasn't even, he was protecting a neighborhood that he worked in, not that he lived in. But why weren't you there? If you're talking about why was he there at 17? Well, clearly he had good parents who trained him and raised him and up to, to be a, an upstanding citizen. Yeah. And if you want to talk about that narrative, why was he there? Well, why was Rosenblum there? Yeah. He had just been released from a, a mental asylum that day. And the first thing he did was run to a riot. And start threatening people and saying he's going to kill people and using the N word as if he it's willy nilly. Yeah. Why why isn't his choices being questioned? Why why are we in a situation where we're cho we're, we're choosing to glorify someone's choice who's a, a, a registered sex offender felon right. who ran to a riot or a seventeen year old kid who went to a riot to try and help? Why are we judging him yeah. and not the what they're trying to claim is a victim? He's not a victim. That's yeah. just the way I see it. Well, I mean, he brought a he brought a gun to a riot, and there's another guy that brought a gun and, and chains and weapons, and all of that stuff is bad. I have a basic philosophy on a lot of these things: is people that don't want to get shot act like it. And if you are in a riot and you have a weapon, it doesn't matter what that weapon is. That weapon can be a bicycle that was swinging around like a maniac. I walked up the street in San Francisco, and the dude had a two by four, like he was Saxon Jim Duggan. Yeah, and he was marching in front of his his stash. That's a weapon. And I had my eyes on him. I adjusted my backpack so I could defend myself against him because he was not someone who was unarmed. Right. You know? And it's a two by four. Throw it in the ground back. I didn't have a weapon. Right. But for sure, sure as hell, I had to be prepared for that. Nothing happened. Um, but the guy was insane. He was he was collecting, he was guarding his collection of news tampons. Okay. So obviously something's wrong with that person. And when someone comes out of an asylum and runs to the riot. This again goes back to that law and order thing. If the authorities can't or won't um, create law and order, then things like that are going to happen. And it's going to put someone like Kyle Rittenhouse or whoever the next person is in a position of life and death. And we wouldn't be judging him if he was dead. We would just forget that he even existed. So here's the issue. If they had killed him and he didn't have a gun, mm -hmm. uh, the narrative would be a 17-year-old kid was murdered in, in these riots by three white men, one with a skateboard, one with yeah. a chain, one with a gun. Right. The, narrative would, the narrative would be completely different, but because he was on the other side of the ideal, right. he's a bad guy. If but, there was a narrative at all. If there's, uh, there's, there's, if there's hundreds there's, of people that were murdered during the, the riots of 2020. Yeah. And, uh, you know, the, the issue is, is that there's a lot of people that went to these protests with the intention of looting, burning, mm -hmm. causing destruction. Um, and a lot of those people were not there for the, the real reason of why they said they were there. And all of those people are just, you know, they, they, everybody wants to talk about white knights and, you know, the, the narrative of white knights and, and white people feeling they need to protect people of color and, and, and all of this. But why aren't these people that are at these, these protests and, and that are causing this damage that happen to be white, why aren't they being considered white knights? Mm. You know, it's, it, if they fall into the idea of the woke mob, then it's okay. But if it's right. on the other side of the fence, then it's not okay. You know, the, the, the issue is that there's so much division and, and there was so much attention paid to um, this narrative of, of racial separation over the past four years. Mm -hmm. And prior to that, when Obama was in, was in office, you never heard about racial division. Mm -hmm. You know, you obviously there were situations where you know there were there was uh, police violence and police right. brutality where it was in the news, but the idea of complete racial separation, racial division, well, you didn't hear anything about it. And then 
four years ago, it, it turns into the most egregious situation in the United States of America. And it's like, where did that come from? Mm. Where did it, was it the media pumping that into everybody? Yeah. Yeah. Or was, or is it, is that really the situation? Cause I don't remember that being the case for me, at least it's uh, five years ago. It's crazy. I was watching uh, a clip from Tim cash IRL. Uh, he had Joe Rogan and a bunch of other guys. And you see what you want about those guys. Joe Rogan has more eyeballs than any single news network. Easily. And when he says, Americans don't trust the news, I don't trust the news. I mean, I, I, I've watched, and there's a reason, I've watched the news report on a press briefing, especially during Donald Trump's presidency. And they say something, and before we go watch a press briefing, and I'm like, whoa, that is a completely different reality. Could you make that assumption about what, you know, could the news be accurate? Maybe, but you had to really try hard to make that be the thing. And so we've lost our faith in that. And, and, and look, the news has a long history of that, lying about Vietnam, lying about lying about all kinds of things. But is it going to get better? I mean, you can create whatever you want now. I mean, you, you not only are a comedian, you create all kinds of things. Joe Rogan can almost say whatever, whatever he wants because he doesn't need anybody to get a job you now. You know? right. If you want to hire him, you know what you're hiring. Yeah. And you know his rate. And if he chooses to take that job, he doesn't have to do anything. Are we going to get better because we have more people that can be more, uh, they're not beholden to, I don't know, a coffee brand or a car brand and, and what they say? I would like to say that that's the case, but I honestly don't think so okay. because I think the issue is um, you have to grow to be a juggernaut in order for that to happen. And there's very few of those people out there. Yeah. Um, and you're fighting against not only the media, because the, 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 the issue with the media is that when news became a currency, that's when, uh, that, that's when journalists, won. um, the news is now a currency. The news is now right. dollars and, you know, every view is, 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 is a dollar. So, I, I think that the issue with the media is that it depends on what they want to prop up. And the other issue is that you now you're dealing with big tech and big tech has a very clear, um, they, they have a very clear agenda as to what side of things that they're, they're pushing. And the problem is unless you become a juggernaut like Joe and you get to a point where you can say what you want to say and, mm -hmm. and um, Spotify is going to allow you to say whatever it is that you want to say. And even, not even Spotify at this point, because you have, you know, Spotify uh, employees threatening to walk out because of, you know, things that Joe's saying. And you've got Dave Chappelle on stage saying uh, jokes about you know, jokes, yeah. uh, jokes, jokes about, you know, the transgender community or what have you. And then yeah. you've got Netflix employees walking out. So do I think it's going to get better? No, I, I, I think the issue is big tech can censor anyone they want. Yeah. And it's a monopoly and you you have two avenues to get your, your message out to the world, out right. to, to, to the people you have the media, which yep. is completely in total bullshit. Right. And you've got big tech, which is complete and total bullshit. Right. So until you build a voice that's big enough to where you can say, F you, I'm going to say what I'm going to say. You can't do that. But if they don't allow you to grow to that point, to have yeah. that voice. Yeah. See, Joe came in at the perfect time. He started his podcast at the perfect time because he started his podcast and started really catching on before all of this divide, before yeah. all this bullshit. And he was a national level performer. Right. To where he could bring in people. He, he was bringing in people from both sides and right. genuinely listening to what they had to say right. prior to big tech and media choosing a side. So he was able to grow before big tech decided, okay, yeah. we don't like the right because they're trying to regulate us and they're trying to, you know, make us publishers, which is really the issue that yeah. big tech has is that the right specifically Donald Trump was trying to make them responsible for the, what happens on yeah. their, on their, their platforms, which I believe they should be. Um, and, and censoring, which they shouldn't be able to do. Right. I feel like, uh, I feel like, Big tech and, and social media should be an open platform for both sides. You know, if you can, if, if Al Qaeda can be on Twitter, yeah, <laughs> and the president of the United States can't be, yeah, that's a real issue. Yeah, it's a serious issue. I, I, uh, 
I personally don't think Donald Trump's good for the country, in part because he just him and his son were just selling Alec Baldwin shot people shirts, you know, and and you can't always choose to divide the country or pick a fight that doesn't need to. Even if his policy idea was right, he would undermine it by commenting. But that stuff is part of American history because he's the president. If I do it, who cares? Kick me off the platform. But he's the American president. And if you ban him, I mean, his title is still Mr. President, right? You know, uh, yeah, I've got a problem with that. The other thing that I don't care for as a creator is um, I can't, I'm not allowed to compete fairly, compete fairly with my other peer shows. I have to, I can have, I can have the best Kevin McNamara interview on the internet and it can be deranked for reasons outside of the quality of what I do. Right. And so, and, and, and not political, just deranked in general because I haven't satisfied some algorithm. One of the favorite things on YouTube is to have this face mm-hmm. on your image and that, that ranks you up. Wow. Right. I'm, that's ridiculous to have a stupid shocked face all the time. I mean, the, the, the fact that you're, um, what do they call that? Uh, what do they call the picture? The, 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 the screenshot? Yeah, yeah. What, is it, what is it called? It's uh, I forget, but it's got a specific term. Yeah. yeah. But um, they've, Instagram, or I'm sorry, not Instagram, YouTube is actually has a video that, that breaks down all of the um, algorithms that are used to decide if your screenshot or whatever it's yeah. called um, will be seen by the most amount of eyes possible and right. it breaks it down to like the font that you use right. how much of this the actual shot is taken up by the font and actually and the rest of the shot is taken up by the person in the shot the colors you use like everything is broken down so much so that there's no creativity and everybody's putting the same picture <sighs> everybody puts up kind of the same idea with the same font with the same colors just yeah. a little bit different to right. differentiate themselves from from the other uh, from the other creators. I don't know. I, to be honest with you, you know, I don't even have a YouTube channel. Yeah. I don't have time. Um, but I do have friends that have YouTube channels. I have a friend who started a YouTube channel. And this, it, it's, this is a, an, an, an exact point of, of kind of the way things work. Um, I have a friend who started a YouTube channel. And the the channel itself is, it's just, it's skits, sketches that are written um, with a specific agenda, that agenda being left mm-hmm. wing. Um, and they're like little five minute to eight minute, I guess you'd call them short TV series, like mini series yeah. type things, where it's like um, uh, racist, r- racist boss refuses to hire a black woman. Jesus. Uh, or, you know, racist kid beats up a black art student or, you know, something like that. Um, and the guy's making $200,000 a month off of YouTube Crazy. because the numbers that he gets are insane because YouTube is pushing all of that to the top of the algorithm because yeah. of those specific keywords, racist, yeah. you know, racist, this okay. racist, that, um, you know, black kid gets abused by this and and it's you know it's um it's interesting because he's he's not left wing <laughs> i love it but he's he's playing their game he's playing the game he's yeah. playing their game um which i respect i respect anybody yeah. who's making two hundred thousand dollars a month but also you're pumping that same agenda that same yeah. message out into the world I mean, that's not called vitriol either that's no. just called facts or yeah. something <laughs> yeah yeah so what you, could i jump on could i could i jump on on youtube and start writing some sketches and yeah. things about uh about that and make a lot of money yeah i could i'm a good writer yeah could i jump on youtube and write a bunch of sketches about sketches about right wing conservative conservative yeah. ideas yeah won't get nearly the same run of numbers. Yeah. Um, but that is, that is where we are. One of the funny things about YouTube is, uh, well, there's a couple of things. Um, one, whenever I fill out the surveys, and I always try to fill the surveys out. I don't know why. Maybe I'm just tilting on a windmill, but I always want to know what I am and what I want to have sex with. And I'm like, I don't know. I'm a creator. <laughs> you know? Why does that stuff matter, right? Like, who cares? I don't care what color you are. I don't care what you have between your legs. I don't care what you bump it. As long as you're not harming kids or anything, what you got to do, you know? 
but um, there's, there's that. I mean, it seems that no matter how many times I de-rank Fox when they offer it, Fox News specifically, this continue to offer it to me. Yeah. And I'm like, I, I don't want that. I still don't want that. Yeah. I'm not going to want that. You know, they, but they always put the same kind of things forward. And I, I search for a lot of stuff because of what I do. And then the search will come back. It should be confused by me. And so I think it is defaults to Fox. Because you're an old white guy, we think. Fox, Fox, Fox. Yeah. Not what I want here. It's, uh, you know, I don't like being put in a box. Mm, okay. It's just kind of where I stand. Yeah. Um, I am who I am. I have the beliefs that I that I have. But that doesn't mean that I, just because I believe some of the same things that other you know, other people may believe, that that makes me what they are. Right. I think people are too quick to start throwing uh, tags on people. You know, if you're conservative, you're a racist. Right. If you, um, you know, if you are a Trump supporter, you're a white supremacist. Right. If you're a Biden supporter, then you're woke. Mm -hmm. If you're if you're pro BLM, then you know you're a, a, a white knight or whatever the hell yeah. it is. Um, I think people, you know, it, the issue that I have is. I'm a, I'm a big fan of, of looking back at history and seeing, you know, what the, the, the real important figures in history have to say about things. And I think, you know, Martin Luther King Jr. said, judge me not by my, the color of my skin, but by the content of my character. Yeah. What happened to that? <laughs> what happened? I don't know. You know, it, just because somebody is... It turns out having good character is hard. Yeah. That's what happened to it. Yeah. I mean, character is, is what you should be judged on, right. you know, in, in, in your actions more so than your words. Yeah. You know, if you're, if, if you're out in a BLM protest and you're, you happen to be a white guy, which I was at the right. BLM protest, I was out there, um, I was out there with my camera and I was taking shots for, for some news organizations while I was out there. Um, and there was multiple situations at the time I had a beard and you know, I was, I had a little bit of tactical gear on because yeah. I was concerned about some things. Um, and I'm out taking shots of, of what was going on on both sides. And you know, I got, I got punched. Yeah. You know, I got hit by both sides of, of the fence. I got, I had a, I, I got jumped by a, a few guys that were thinking that I was like a, a white supremacist or whatever. And then the cops whacked me with a baton because I was trying to help up an elderly black man that yeah. was on the front line. So I got it from both sides of things. Yeah. Um, but my actions were always, I'm trying to get the story right. of what's really happening. Yeah. I wasn't out there trying to make the cops look good. I wasn't out there trying to make BLM look good. Yeah. I was out there getting shots of reality. What was really happening in the moment. Right. And Anybody there, depending on which side you're looking at, if I've got a camera and I'm taking shots, if I'm taking pictures of the BLM side of things, BLM could say, oh, he's trying to, he's trying to make us look bad. Yeah. And the cops could say, oh, he's trying to make them look good. Right. It's the actions of what you're doing. If you're out there burning things and breaking into buildings and looting and robbing, you're a bad person. Right. If you're a cop and you're out there whacking people with batons and, you know, shooting peaceful people with rubber bullets that are right. on the front lines doing nothing, you're a bad person. But if you're on both sides of the fence and you're just there voicing your, 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 your matter of the things and you're a cop and you're just doing your job and you're standing there with a baton trying to save a building that's burning, yeah. then who's the bad guy in that situation? There is no bad guy in that situation. It's about your actions. It's about the content of your character, mm -hmm. who you are as a person. When you look at the content of character and you try to establish what good character is for Kevin, right? right. Um, but then also externally, like when someone, when you try to assess their character, what, what does that look like for you? And what is, what do you want to see from somebody else if they have good character? Honestly, like what happened to morale manners? Mm -hmm. What happened to, um, you know, nowadays it's interesting to me how, Things that used to be looked at as something that made you a, a, a man, a respectful man, or, or a respectful woman, is now looked at as you're you're being condescending. Mm. Like if I open a door for a woman, um, it's looked at as you know it used to be you're being yeah. a gentleman, right? And now it's a, I don't need you to open the door for me. I can open the door for myself. Okay, fine. Yeah. Sure, uh, of course you can. Sure you can. Of course you can. Yeah. Yes, great. 
I was just trying to show respect or, you know, shaking hands or, right. or, you know, getting up out of your seat so that a woman or an elderly person can sit down. All of these things that like I look at now is you're, you're, you're mansplaining or you're, you're looking down, you're being condescending to people. Right. Um, to me, what the content of someone's characters is, is, is someone who respects people, whether, whether you know them or, or not, mm-hmm. just based on the fact that they are a man or a woman or a person. Yeah. And you're respectful of their, of their space. You're respectful of their, their wishes. Mm-hmm. Treat others as you would like to be treated. Me, myself, I, I, I would love for somebody to just say hello when I walk down the street. Nobody does that anymore. Mm-hmm. Especially in LA. You walk down the street and somebody's walking by and you say, hey, hey, how are you? How, yeah. How's your day? Yeah. You, know, you just kind of look at you like you're crazy. It's like, cool, <laughs> got it. Right on. You know, it's, um, you know, holding a door for me or, or if I see someone else hold a door for a woman or hold a door for an elderly person, yeah. I think that's, that, I love that. I, I love yeah. that. The door thing is interesting. I open doors for people, for people. Right. And I, have on occasion, and it's pretty rare, but I've on occasion had someone, a, a female say, you know, I can open the door myself. I'm like, I'm just, I've got a moment for anybody and I have a door open and just because you come through, I'll hold it for the next three people if they're all in a bunch. I'm like, come on in. Right. And I bet you someone after that opens the next door. You know, like in that little, you know, the two-door hallway kind of thing. Right. Because we all want to return their favor. And there is that. That does exist. But also, the other day, I was at my high school. I talked to my high school every year. And uh, you have to push the, the doorbell, which is sad on high school. You have to push a doorbell and stand there and wait. You know, you don't know what's going on. There's no interaction. So you literally just stand there like, Hey. Yeah, because <laughs> right, you can't just walk into the administration office. And then there was a kid there, a student, and he stood there. And maybe he didn't see me push the button, but he kind of looked at me and then ignored me and then went over. And I said, "All right, I pushed the button. I'm just waiting." Yeah, and ignored me, ignored my presence. And I'm like, I, "That's not very respectful." I mean, if nothing else, you can tell I'm an elder. I've got a gray beard. You know, yeah. you should at least be like, "Oh, thank you, sir," or something, or, or acknowledge that I exist instead of just like turning away from me. Like, what the heck? Yeah, I think, um, you know, it's so funny. I used to, when I was younger, I used to listen to people older, you know, mm-hmm. uh, my elders, if you will. I used to listen to them say things like back in my day or in my time. And I would always be like, yes, uh, you know, okay, relax. But nowadays I say the same thing because in my time, it was it, parenting was very different, you know. Now there's the timeouts, and the, we, we, you know, we're equals. Our mm-hmm. child is equal to us. So your child shouldn't fear you, or you shouldn't strike your child. That was okay. Um, growing up, you were you had no choice but to respect your parents. You had no choice to be to respect elders. Right. You know, if I went out, I used to play pickup basketball all the time when I was a kid. Same. And I would go to the park, and I would play. And I'd be, you know, 13, 14 playing with grown men. Yeah. And I had to watch what I said. Yeah. I had to watch my P's and Q's because if I didn't, they would have no problem with smacking me, you know, or putting me on my ass. Yeah. And that taught me that you have to respect those who are older than you. You respect your elders. Nowadays, I play pickup. I'm 42. Mm-hmm. Nowadays, I play pickup basketball. And these 13, 14 year olds are, you know, F this, F that, you're a bitch, this, that, and the other. It's just like, and you can't do or say anything about it because if you do, yeah. someone's going to call the cops or, the, or you're a bully or you're, you know, you're a child abuser and all these sort of things. Yeah. There's no repercussions anymore for, for bad behavior. And especially in California, if you look at things with, you know, the, the, the laws now with, you know, um, shoplifting, as long as it's nine, I think it's 900 and something dollars or less. That's crazy. That's not sustainable. They don't even, they don't even prosecute. Yeah. It's not, it's a, it's not even a misdemeanor. It's a, you, you get a, you get a fine if you get caught. Well, if they don't pursue you to catch you, then you don't get caught. So you're right. just stealing really no, and there's no repercussion. Yeah. So when you have a, a society that's been taught that there's no repercussions for the things that you do, of course, you, people, are, the, the, the character of that society starts to dwindle down mm-hmm. to the basest character yeah. possible. And when you've got a media that's constantly been pushing the narrative of, you know, being dumb is, is cool. Yeah. Being, you know, being uneducated is cool. Don't yeah. go to school. Don't get an education. <laughs> be a, yeah. Be a, be a, be a, a, 
a social media star yeah. or be a rapper or be this, you know, what happened to the generation of people that, that it was, it was drilled into your head. Yeah. You need to go out and learn the things that build up society. Yeah. We, we need, you know, we need doctors, we need lawyers, we need uh, uh, rocket, you know, rocket scientists. We need scientists. We need these people that, that could continue to build the, the, you know, the society right. as a, a, you know, in a better direction, but that's not pushed anymore. It's like, everybody's a butterfly. Yeah. Everybody's a, a, a weird a butterfly and you, and you should, you should, Spread your wings. Do you feel like there's less pickup sports today? I mean, you're in LA, so maybe it's different. But I know in my hometown, there was always a game running. You knew where the courts were. Uh, I don't know. I would say it's probably still about the same. Um, I think, I think there's less people playing. Okay. You know, you've got, you know, kids. When I was a kid, you couldn't stay inside. You weren't allowed to be inside. Right, right, right. If it was nice outside, get your ass outside, figure right. something out. Right. You know, if they, you have nothing to do, find something to do. Nowadays, with you know, video games and, and yeah. cell phones and all this stuff, you know, you, you're more likely to see kids sitting at a park on their phone rather than playing basketball or catch or whatever it is. I played a lot of pickup basketball too, pickup football, pickup baseball, whatever it was, and you had to learn how to navigate that reality. Bigger kids playing with smaller kids, sometimes men playing with you know, and you had to decide like what kind of player you're going to be, how you. You call a foul, right? You call your own fouls and pick up basketball. And if you call fouls like you're a bitch, you're going to get called a bitch. Right. And then you're going to have to back up that. Or everybody just starts calling you a bitch and you become this bitch and go over there and play like that guy's. And you quickly develop this persona. So you have to have some level of toughness and you have to back up what you say you're going to do. Otherwise, again, like it, you learn to work as a community. And if you go and you play, like I played in a lot of, um, you know, it, I, mean, I went to areas where there are black folks and all kinds of different people that I played with. And there's different vibes and everything in the different games. But as long as you were respectful, look, someone might give you a hassle and you're always on the edge of a fight if you're really in a, a problematic area. Like, you know, we're just everybody. You've been in games where you're like, ooh, everybody's kind of upset. Yeah, I, mean, I grew up in Detroit. Yeah. 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 Exactly. yeah. But you also could navigate that. You didn't just leave. I mean, if it got crazy and someone pulled out a gun, of course you leave then. But there's always kind of like a tension in the right kind of a uh, basketball court where like someone might get in a fight with somebody else. Well, I think the, I, I think because, well, yeah, especially back then because there were repercussions for, for the things you did and said, yeah. you know, and you had to have a toughness about you, you, you know, you, you, you didn't call weak fouls. You just didn't, especially in Detroit, you call weak fouls. The next yeah. game you don't get picked up. You right. know, you get looked at, but you, you know. yeah. Yeah. Um, you, and, and there were repercussions for the things you said and did. Nowadays, it's not the same. Like, the problem is everything, everybody wants to nerf the world. Everybody wants to make these kids, you know, um, bullet, they, want, they don't want bulletproof kids. They want, yeah. they want no bullets. Yeah. It doesn't work. Right. Kids are mean. Yeah. Kids are mean. Kids are mean. Yeah. And if you're, you're trying to nerf their, everybody gets a participation trophy. Everybody tried real hard. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Nobody, there are no scores in T-ball. Right. Everybody, we don't know what the score is. Everybody just plays. Yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah. Great. But what are you teaching these kids? You're, you're, when, you, when you're trying to bulletproof your kid and you're trying to nerf the world, you're not, you're not putting your kid in the position to know how to deal with adversity when adversity comes and it's going to come. Yeah. And that's why you have these kids that don't know how to deal with their emotions, don't know how to deal with adversity, don't have any idea what it is to be put in a dangerous situation and how to deal with it. No street smarts whatsoever. Yeah. And they end up in these situations with these kids who have been put in these situations and are tough and they get their asses beat or, you know, they get bullied. And that's yeah. where you get school shooters from. Right. Because these kids that don't know how to deal with their emotions, don't know how to defend themselves and they just want to lash out. There's a lot of smarts in that. I mean, the pick a basketball thing is a great example of that. You could be there. You and I are playing back, pick a basketball. I'm 50, you're 40, you know. And if we see young bucks kind of getting young bucky, we'll let them run a little bit. But we'll probably also both, like, calm it the hell down before it gets too out of hand. Yeah. Right? Like, yeah, these guys got to figure it out, you know. Yeah. Uh, and there is a, uh, a hierarchy. But, like, I remember being a little kid, and, look, I had a big motor. I just ran around, you know, and I tried to smack the ball, and I played a lot of defense, passed a lot. So nobody might have played with me. But sometimes guys would get upset because I was a big effort guy. And then they would start to try to pick on me. 
And yeah. because someone else would respect my game, the fact that I passed the ball, the other the other alpha there on the court would be like, you know, leave the white boy alone. Yeah. And then they would leave the white boy alone. But I, but I had to play my game. I had to play hard. I had to stop the best player in the other team. And everybody appreciated that. So I found my spot in games where I wasn't the best player, not even close, but I could fit in and do something. That's where I learned how to adapt to an environment that I was foreign to. But I, I, I learned through my actions and my character of my game. I think, I think the issue is if you play in it, so sticking with that idea of yeah. pickup basketball, if you play with a toughness that's equal to the toughness around you, that white boy shit drops off. Yeah. I, you know, I didn't, nobody ever said the, the white boy when I played. Right. Granted, I, I was, you know, I was known in my neighborhood, but yeah. nobody ever said the white boy. Why did you go courts away from my neighborhood? Too? Even then, you know? even then, because I would show up and I would establish that, hey, yeah. I'm, I'm a player. Yeah. You know, yeah. I, you want to throw all those? I'll throw all those with you. Sure. You want to, you want to play hard? I'll play hard. You want to play no blood, no foul? Let's yeah. fucking play no blood, no foul. I got yeah. no problem with that. Yeah, right. And that white boy shit drops off when you do that because you're playing up to the caliber of the people around you. And you're playing with the toughness of the people around you. And then they just see you as an athlete. Yeah. And, and that's, you know, that's going back to the, you know, the, the character yeah. side of things. Right. People will start seeing you mm. as a human, as a person, rather than a color by the way that you carry yourself. If you okay. carry yourself like a piece of shit. Yeah. You're, then you're a piece of shit. Yeah. yeah. Period. And shit, last time I checked, is is shit. <laughs> you know? It doesn't matter. Yeah. You know? So, at the end of the day, I think it, it's it's just, it's the way you carry yourself mm. and, 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 and carrying yourself in a way that you are all right with people judging you based on your character because you know that your character is strong enough to be judged. I want to change gears a little bit, but I want to stick with basketball. Uh, sure. A friend asked uh, an overall question on Facebook. If you played one-on-one -on -one with President Obama, would you win and how would you do it? I, and I was, when I played one-on-one -on -one in basketball in general, I didn't shoot a lot because I'm just not a very good shooter. I'm ambidextrous. So I would shoot, both hands get in the way, but I could pass like crazy and all that kind of stuff. So um, I just said, and you, I know you'll appreciate this. I'm like, I'd absolutely whip his ass because I wouldn't play with any respect for who he was. And I would rick the horn and warm him to death. I would, because you got to call your own fouls. I'd slap the shit out of his hands all the time. There's no five foul rule. And we just rough house. And yeah. if he could beat me rough housing, then good. You know, and if the Secret Service stepped on the court, I'd be like, ball. <laughs> take it off the court, I'd take the foul, you know. That's how I'd beat him. How, yeah. would, you, how would you beat the president? I mean, I'm 6'5", 220. I'd body him in the post and lay yeah. him up. You know? Yeah. He's not, he's not keeping me out of the post. Um, yeah, and I don't see him getting a shot up over me. And he's he's a shooter. He's not a he's not a dribble drive penetrator. Right. From right. what I saw, he doesn't really have handles. He can shoot, but that's about it. Yeah. So I, I'd I'd smoke him. <laughs> <laughs> I'd smoke him. I don't I don't see yeah. yeah I don't see Obama getting a shot up on me. To yeah. Be honest. Yeah. Yeah, you're tall. You're tall. Yeah. yeah, that's the other thing too. Is if I get the ball, I'm gonna back him down at his big butt and. Yeah. and I'm going to do the Raymond Tisdale thing. Just get him down close and then flip a little left-handed hook up around. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to post, I'm going to, post him to death. Yeah, I like yeah. it. I like it. Tell me what you're working on creatively besides comedy. Uh, so right now I've got, uh, I'm in post-production on a short film I directed called Hose. Um, and that's going to be a festival project. So once we get the post-production done on that, we're going to start shooting it out to festivals yeah. and, nice. and seeing what we can do with that. Um, I've also got a film, another film that I wrote called Topper that right now is in the uh is in the stages of of working on getting investors together that i'll be directing as well um right now we have some really great names attached to that some pretty big names attached to that film and we have a few we have two investors on now and other investors interested so we're looking to hopefully start shooting that in february um and then tv series that i'm pitching uh, that i wrote uh, that we have some some interest in as well um, and my production company, you know, getting my production company off the ground and, and getting that kind of working in the right direction. That's kind of where I'm at right now, besides the stand up thing. Yeah. And uh, hopefully, season three of Why Women Kill. So, yeah. Yeah. It's a lot of work. In Hollywood, you have to be multi slashed, you know, an like actor, comedian, producer, director, writer. I mean, I'm not saying anything that you're not familiar with. Yeah, especially nowadays. Right. Yeah, you got to be able to do everything. 
got to be a creator more so than just a, an artist. When you look at those things, I mean, if you can build your own projects with largely your own money or your own pockets of money that you can go to and pay everybody back, you at some point don't need a studio anymore. Right. Because you've got, you know, it's like when, when Danny DeVito and Arnold Schwarzenegger made all of their money on twins. I mean, they, because they just did it themselves, they didn't need the studio to do it. They just paid for it. Yeah. Is that... Um, is that your future? You think you just have the independence, or do you, or do you want the big studio money and, and access? No, I don't. I don't want it. Um, I want to. I, I love the idea of, of independent. You know, obviously you've got to get distribution eventually. Sure. Um, it, be it through. I love the. I, I, I love the model of, of streaming. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, not so much for the residual aspect because there really aren't any right. residuals. Um, but I love the idea that if you can put together a good enough project that you can turn around and pretty much guarantee that you're going to get your budget back plus whatever. Right. Right. Investors love that, obviously, because they, they want to make sure their ROI is safe. Um, but yeah, I don't... The reason I got into... I really got into writing, directing, producing everything behind the camera is because I got tired of begging for my supper, yeah. to be honest with you. Um, um, I'm sick of going in auditioning for projects that I don't believe in scripts that are shitty, right. terribly written scripts. Right. Um, the same old bullshit that Hollywood's been pumping out for years and years. It's the YouTube thing, right? The stupid thumbnail that has to always be the same. It's, it's uh, yeah. I, I, but more so just the same repetitive story over and over and over, you know, remakes and reboots and, and uh, sequels and, you know, it, Hollywood really doesn't take any chances anymore. And the only films that really take chances are independent. Yeah. And that's kind of where I want to be. Yeah. I prefer to create art and create cinema and not just try to run out there and make guaranteed box office bullshit. Yeah. Yeah. I yeah. wanted, I'm just, I'm tired of, uh, you know, I'm tired of doing, I'm tired of auditioning for things that I don't believe in. Yeah. I'm tired of begging for my stuff, but I'm just going to make my own stuff. Yeah. And, um, and have fun with it and not be told what I, who I can hire and what I can talk about and what I can write about and, and um, you know, have a, a studio constantly just you know, pumping their narrative into yeah. what needs to be in my, my projects. If anything, there are more studios making a wider array of projects than ever before or funding them or whatever they're going to do. I mean, BYU has a TV channel and they fund their own projects and you don't have to be super Mormon guy to do that you can just be like i have a project that's family friendly and they're like yeah it's good yeah you know because they're all looking everybody's looking to try to create their brand's content so it doesn't have to be apple it doesn't have to be anybody yeah i mean in the past you had you know five really five networks yeah you know um and that was kind of all you had to work with yeah now you have hundreds of networks streaming services and all these other avenues to get your your stuff out there um which makes it you're you're definitely muddying the waters because you're taking you've got so many avenues that you don't have enough eyeballs to really get some serious views on it but if your stuff is good people will find it so i think the important thing is it forces people to work harder to make better projects you can't just make bullshit anymore and throw it up on a network and you get four or five million eyeballs on it because it's on NBC or CBS or ABC because even NBC isn't just NBC that NBC is Peacock and yeah. all these other things like they're yeah. competing with themselves for market share yeah and you don't get the same eyeballs that you used to because people have the option to go out and find good stuff yeah you know that's why SNL fucking sucks <laughs> SNL is terrible SNL now the product that they put out compared to what they did before is it's horrible why they don't work hard anymore. They just, you know, and they keep getting Emmy nom- nominations just because they're SNL. Yeah. And you, you, you know, you look at the, for instance, and this isn't just because uh, Joe is a friend of mine, but yeah. this is this something that really like bugged me. Um, SNL did this sketch. It was, a, I don't know, it was supposed to be Sesame street or something. And uh, they did a sketch with Joe Rogan was and Joe Rogan was talking to Big Bird about uh, you know how to how to battle COVID nineteen or something. I don't even yeah. the, the sketch just was stupid. Didn't make any sense. But 
um, Pete Davidson was playing Joe Rogan, made no attempt to do a Joe Rogan voice. Um, they basically just put a bald cap on him and put him in a black t-shirt. No, no fake tattoos, no nothing. And it was just Joe Rogan giving Big Bird vitamins and ivermectin and saying, oh, this is how you cure it. And right. Big Bird's like, isn't this horse medicine? And Pete Davidson's like, well, I took it. So, uh, yeah, it's horse medicine, but it's human medicine too, maybe, I guess. And it's just like, this is so lazy. Yeah. It, yeah. And it's... It's an old narrative. This, you know, the, the, the issue that is, you, you're talking about saying it live and they're talking about something that happened a month ago. Yeah. It's like, you guys have writers that write 24 7, seven days a week. And yeah, pitch, pitch meetings. You're, you pitch meetings. Like, <laughs> and you, you're putting an actor, you're, you're putting Pete Davidson to play Joe Rogan. Pete Davidson is tall, wiry, and skinny. Joe Rogan yeah. is short and stout. Right. He's not making any effort to even do an impression. He's speaking with his own voice. Yeah, that is lazy. It's so lazy. And Big Bird is five foot seven. Yeah. You know, and it's just like, there, there's no effort put forth. Mm. There's no, it, it's such a clear narrative of what SNL, SNL is so pushing that woke agenda that they won't touch the other things that might be funny. Right. And they just kind of play the laziest. Absolutely a character you can, do a caricature of. I mean, he always wears a stupid shirt that his wife must have gave him, the black one with the buttons and everything else when he really does fight stuff. And he says all kinds of cliche things and yeah. he's always kind of sweaty. And you could absolutely do a great imitation. He's super energetic. He's right. got a very distinct voice. Yeah. You know, he's, he has taglines that he uses all right. the time. Right. Like, there's so much you have to work with. Yeah. You could put a headset on Pete Davidson as if he was, you know, uh, commentating for the UFC. Yeah. You could have had, you know, you could have had him in a shirt that, you know, that says like, you know, has a deer on it with a right. arrow through the head or something yeah. like there was so yeah. many different things. Why did eh, put him in a black t-shirt, give him a ball cap. <laughs> what about the tattoos? Yeah. Nah, don't worry about it. What about the voice? Nah, don't yeah. worry about it. What about that? He looks nothing like Joe Rogan. Nah, don't worry about it. Well, should we give him some dialogue that Joe Rogan would say? Nah, don't worry about it. Yeah. Well, what the hell are you doing? Yeah. You're a sketch yeah. comedy show. Other, it's ridiculous. Are there any characters coming? Because I, I think about like we just lost Norm McDonald, and I mean his Burt Reynolds was hilarious, amazing. I mean, so good, right? And and he, you knew he was doing a caricature of a caricature of a character. Yeah, but it was absolutely on money. You know, he did that great. And the guy that did uh, Sean Connery, I can't remember his name right now, fantastic. You know, and it was super entertaining. I could watch that bit over and over again. But I can't think of any real skits right now. And I, I try to watch SNL, but. I fast forward through a lot of it. It's terrible. It's, it's just like, let's just make political jokes from one side of the spectrum and like not funny, not funny. And it's lazy. It's, it's lazy, lazy, right? I don't mind, Dave Chappelle makes fun of everybody. I don't mind listening to whatever I believe in being made fun of. And I'm a middle of the road guy, so you can make fun of me by just making me non committal. I mean, can you imagine the middle of the road uh, 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 protest? You'd be like, can't we all get along? Can't yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, like, hey, Holding up a sign that this, it's like a, he's holding a sign with an arrow on it that says what he says. Yeah. And he's just yeah, standing yeah. next to another guy with a sign. Yeah. Like, you know, there's so many jokes that pe could be made. And it, what's crazy to me, and this is what really shows the laziness of the show now, is um, all they do now is read off the cue cards. Mm. I don't remember in the 80s and 90s ever seeing any Chevy Chase or. or you know, that's wrong. Will fail any of them. I never saw any of them reading off a cue card and, right. and, and reading straight to camera. Right. You know, now every sketch, every sketch you watch on, on saying it live, they're clearly reading off a cue card. Yeah. It's like, you can't right. memorize these lines. You can't memorize a three minute sketch. Right. In a week, you have a week yeah. to memorize a three minute sketch. These guys were all second city guys before i mean there's a whole bunch of that that improv thing and also I, and again i don't see this very often but someone is so funny that they're all trying to keep it together which is hilarious when you watch that my gardeners are here oh yeah we're we're gonna, gonna, we'll wrap this thing up here. they're gonna start with they're gonna start with the uh the whip the, the uh is anybody that's doing a good job on snl right now i mean if you want to talk about impressions jay farrow is incredible okay um, he's, he's one of the best impressionists, um, but they don't use them in the capacity that they should use them. They really only use them for, um, weekend update. Right. Um, God, is there anybody that I can think of that's truly talented on the show? Uh, 
I mean, there's so many names in the past. Fallon, Murphy, Murray. I mean, there's so many. We were like, these guys left because they had to leave because it, it was too small of a cage for them. Yeah. I, I mean, I don't, right now. I can't think of a name. You know, the last real star I can think of from SNL would be Will Ferrell. Um, you know, Chris Red is really funny, but he's more, he's funnier as a stand up than he is on mm-hmm. the show, and they don't use him very much. Um, yeah, I can't think of anybody really. Jay, Jay Farrell is, is an incredible, he, he does incredible impressions, but they don't use him the way that they should. Other than that, just not no. right now. Um, God, what's his name? Uh, what's the guy who's in that sh- the, the, um, the show where he plays a coach, a soccer coach? Ted Lasso? Ted Lasso, yeah. What's that guy's name? I don't know. I forget his name. Yeah. He, was, he was great. He was good. Um, but since him, I can't remember anybody really. Can't really think of anybody. They do go through uh, eras, right? Yeah. And, and maybe the pendulum is too far to left. All right, what do you think in closing before I wrap this thing? Uh, shit, it's going to sound cliche, but, you know, let's just come together. All right. I think that I don't think there's anything wrong with that, with, with having different opinions. Um, whatever happened to communication, whatever happened to just talking and hashing things out. Um, I think it's okay to, to be devout to your beliefs. I think it's okay to, to be, um, to have a, a really strong belief system in the things that you really believe in. Yeah. But I also think it's very important to understand that other people have different beliefs and that's okay. Yeah. I think it's okay to, to disagree. I think it's healthy to disagree. I think if everybody just agreed on everything, the world would be a super fucking boring place and nothing would really get done. Yeah. So I think you need outsiders. I think you need people that think on the edge of society. I think you need people that have different opinions. I think that's where art comes from and, and, uh, and beauty. And, and that's where um, amazing things like podcasts come from. Yeah. As, as much as everybody uh, talks poorly about podcasts and, and there's a billion podcasts and all these other things, it gives you an opportunity to put two people in a room that may have a different opinion yeah. and hear them work it out through words. And at the end, they still might not agree. But it's very rare that you see a podcast that comes to fisticuffs. <laughs> you know? Yeah. And, and I don't agree with everything you said in terms of like philosophy. We, we can't. We can't all agree on these no. things. But we can't tolerate it. And and just because we disagree doesn't make you a racist or me a racist or any other thing. It's like we're just we're people trying to figure out as best we can how to do what it is that we need to do. And uh, I, I got this um, thing the other day. They're like, here's an opportunity for you because you're a veteran, blah, blah, blah. Fill out this thing. And it's like, which cause do you care about? This, this cause sheet had nothing to do with what they were asking me to do. And every cause in there was like, well, you're assuming that any of these things is important to me. Like my survival was the most important thing to me. Yeah. You know, I'm trying not to, you know, my brother just died last month. I'm dealing with all of that. You know, but you think I care about all these other social issues? Come on. I mean, yeah. I, it's, I don't. And, and so I added new, I fixed it for him. I put new boxes. My box was, I care about being left to fuck alone. <laughs> so yeah. Just let me. Do what I'm trying to do. I'm not trying to hurt anybody, you know? I think it's important to to remember certain things when it comes to dealing with other people. Mm. I think it's important to realize that that there's certain aspects of people that are just human nature. Yeah. Humans are tribal by nature. That's right. It just is the way it is. Yeah. Always has been. You know, um, people want to take the animal aspect out of humans. And when you do that, you expect humans to be this, uh, you know, um, all-knowing, all-seeing, all-feeling all creature. Right. And that's not what we are. We're flawed. We're, um, we're tribal. We're, we're, we have feelings and emotions. Mm. We have moods. And they, they change. Humans are fluid. One thing that we might not know tomorrow, we might know the next day. And one thing we believe today, we might not believe tomorrow. We, we're constantly being bombarded with information and that information changes a human being from day to day. So understand that somebody you might not agree with today, you might agree with them tomorrow. Your opinion may change to what they believe or their opinion might change to what you believe. Yeah. But to judge somebody today on who they are right. based on their beliefs or, or, or 
the things that they're 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 going through instead of ha- without having a, a, a conversation with them without communicating with them and just putting them into a box based on that and not the content of their character is wrong you have to yeah. everybody needs to have a little bit more patience that's all i gotta say about Ooh, it. if you think martin luther king was right right and it's uh yeah. that's it yeah. it's easy to, to tolerate what you like the trick is tolerating things that you don't agree with you don't have to approve of something that's bad but you do have to accept that that person is in that spot because of where they came from. You came from Detroit. I came from California. We have different realities. And when we have to move them together, I have to allow you to be the dude that you are. And in some way, you have to allow me to be the dude that I am. And then we figure out where we work out in between. I think That's the issue, I, I, think, I think a very important thing is to understand that you are flawed. Have a, have a real understanding of yourself. Have a real conversation with yourself. Yeah. And when you can come to terms with the fact with the fact that you yourself are flawed, then you can come to terms with the fact that others are flawed. And that's okay. It's okay to be flawed. I'm not perfect, not nearly perfect. I'm a complete moron. But I know that everybody around me is a complete moron too. So I can't judge somebody for being what I am. I'm just patient. I just try to be more patient. That's all I can do.